This past year has been challenging in many ways. Many of the things that we have accepted as normal have been changed. At MAPS, one of our biggest programs during the spring months has been our American History Field Trip Program. In 2019, we welcomed about 3,500 students from 21 local high schools to the museum. The response from both students and teachers had been very positive in the past. Unfortunately, the pandemic prevented these visits both last year and this. The purpose of this series of short videos is to bring maps to your classroom until we can again provide the actual visits. In this first video presentation, we will conduct a virtual tour of some of the displays here at MAPS that were central to our American History program. As we do not have the same time restrictions that were normal during an actual visit, we can cover more of the displays and a little more of an in-depth background. We can also introduce you to a second display room, one that we typically do not have time to show during in-person visits. We will, however, still focus on some of the key social studies learning standards around which our program has been built. We also hope to highlight some of the local connections to the state of Ohio. All of the videos and photographs used in this presentation were taken here at the MAPS Air Museum. The role of aviation as an instrument of warfare started with World War I. Tensions had been brewing throughout Europe for years before the war actually broke out. A number of alliances involving European powers, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, and other parties had existed for years, but political instability in the Balkans threatened to destroy these agreements. The spark that ignited World War I was struck in Sarajevo, Bosnia, where Archduke Franz Ferdinand heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire was shot to death along with his wife Sophie by the Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip on June 28, 1914. Princip and other nationalists were struggling to end Austro-Hungarian rule over Bosnia and Herzegovina. World War I was the first major conflict to harness the power of the aircraft. At the dawn of World War I, aviation was a relatively new field. The Wright brothers took their first sustained flight just 11 years before in 1903. Aircraft were initially used primarily for reconnaissance missions. The first machine guns were successfully mounted on planes in June of 1912 in the United States, but were imperfect. If timed incorrectly, the bullet could easily destroy the propeller of the plane it came from. By war's end, the Allies were producing five times more aircraft than the Germans. The war devastated a continent. World War I took the lives of more than 9 million soldiers, with 21 million more wounded. Civilian casualties numbered close to 10 million. The two nations most affected were Germany and France, each of which sent some 80% of their male population between the ages of 15 and 49 into battle. The political disruption surrounding World War I also contributed to the fall of four imperial dynasties, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Allied leaders stated their desire to build a post-war world that would safeguard itself against future conflicts of such devastating scale. But the Treaty of Versailles, signed on June 28, 1919, would not achieve that lofty goal. Saddled with war guilt, heavy reparations, and denied entrance into the League of Nations, Germany felt tricked into signing the treaty having believed that any peace would be a peace without victory. As the years passed, hatred of the Versailles Treaty and its authors settled into a smoldering resentment in Germany. That and the onset of the Great Depression resulted in the rise of nationalist movements in the country, one headed by a young, ambitious, Austrian-born German politician. 
When the First World War ended, the United States was quick to leave behind its European commitment. Disillusionment over World War I fed opposition to foreign entanglements and support for the policy of American isolationism. Strong anti-war and non-interventionist sentiments were expressed by the America First Committee, a group who favored isolationism and staunchly opposed U.S. intervention or providing aid to the Allies. In late 1940, national hero and aviator Charles Lindbergh became the spokesman for the anti-war America First Committee. Speaking to overflow crowds in Madison Square Garden in New York City and Soldier Field in Chicago, his speeches were heard by millions. While America did not enter the war until after the attack at Pearl Harbor, Americans were already volunteering to enter the fight. A number of American flyers joined the three Eagle Squadrons of the Royal Air Force early in 1941. These squadrons were composed primarily of American flyers. Among these flyers were Don Blakesley of Fairport Harbor, Ohio, and Don Gentile of Piqua, Ohio. When America entered the war in 1941, the Eagle Squadrons became part of the U.S. Army Air Corps. These veteran pilots provided a wealth of experience to flyers who had never seen combat. Most Americans are familiar with what happened at the American Naval Base at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. The Pearl Harbor display in the Gallery of Heroes is at the heart of our World War II collection. Of the 2,403 American casualties that were suffered that morning, 1,177 of those died on one ship, the USS Arizona. 41 of those who died were from the state of Ohio. Part of the collection at the MAPS Air Museum is a small piece of the superstructure of the battleship USS Arizona. President Franklin Roosevelt made a speech the next day to a joint session of Congress asking for a declaration of war. A copy of the congressional record of that speech is also included in the Pearl Harbor display. Among those that perished that morning was an Ohio resident by the name of Robert Scott. Machinist mate First Class Scott was assigned to the battleship USS California when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. The compartment containing the air compressor to which Scott was assigned as his battle station was flooded as a result of a torpedo hit. The remainder of the personnel evacuated the space but Scott refused to leave, saying words to the effect that, This is my station, and I will stay and give them air as long as the guns are going. For his heroic actions on that fateful morning, Robert R. Scott was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Scott is not the only Ohio resident awarded the Medal of Honor that we have honored here at the MAPS Air Museum. Among those Ohio Medal of Honor winners that we have remembered with displays and memorials are William Pittenger of Knoxville, Ohio, who fought in the Civil War and was one of the first recipients of the Medal of Honor. Robert A. Penn of Perry Township, Ohio, was one of only four black Americans from Ohio to receive the Medal of Honor during the American Civil War. William R. Richardson of Cleveland, Ohio, awarded the Medal of Honor for actions during the Battle of Petersburg during the Civil War. David Ayers of Kalita, Ohio, won the Medal of Honor during the Siege of Vicksburg during the Civil War. Harold G. Epperson of Akron, Ohio, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for actions during the Battle of Saipan in World War II. Joseph Cicchetti from Waynesburg, Ohio, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for Heroism Under Fire in the campaign to recapture the Philippines during World War II. Melvin Mayfield of St. Louisville, Ohio, received the Medal of Honor for actions under fire on Luzon in the Philippines during World War II. He was one of the last to receive this honor during World War II. 
Robert Rosser of Columbus, Ohio, was awarded the Medal of Honor for gallantry during the Korean War. Joseph LaPointe Jr. from Dayton, Ohio, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for actions during the Vietnam War. Ted Belcher, buried at Zanesville, Ohio, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for heroism under fire in Vietnam. Ralph E. Diaz, buried at Letona, Ohio, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for actions in Vietnam. David F. Winder, buried at Mansfield, Ohio, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for heroism under fire in Vietnam. And Donald R. Long, from Black Fork, Ohio, was a recipient of the Medal of Honor for actions in Vietnam. World War II also highlighted continued inequities within American society in which a number of groups face bias in both career opportunities and even in their ability to serve this nation. Among these groups were African Americans, Native Americans, Japanese Americans, and women. The Tuskegee Airmen is the popular name given to a group of African American pilots who fought in World War II. The Tuskegee Airmen were the first African American military aviators in the United States Armed Forces. In 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt, over the objection of his top generals, ordered the creation of an all-black flight training program located at the Tuskegee Army Airfield in Alabama. Unfortunately, the Tuskegee Airmen were subject to racial discrimination both within and outside of the Army. Despite these adversities, they trained and flew with distinction. However, racism in this country did not change significantly during the war. The heroes that served with the Tuskegee Airmen and other African American units were brought home on segregated ships and returned to the same racism and segregation that they left. The Tuskegee Airmen made up the 332nd Fighter Group, which deployed to Italy in early 1944, commanded by Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. In a time of segregation in this nation, Davis paved the way for African American men and women in the military that would come after him. He followed in his father's footsteps in breaking racial barriers. His father, Benjamin O. Davis Sr., was the first African American to become a general in any branch of the U.S. military. Davis graduated from Central High School in Cleveland, Ohio. He continued his education at Western Reserve University in Cleveland and then the University of Chicago. Davis earned a 1932 nomination to the U.S. Military Academy from Representative Oscar S. DePriest, then America's only black congressman. He was the first African American to be admitted to the Academy since Reconstruction. During the four years of his time at the Academy, Davis was racially isolated by his white classmates, few of whom spoke to him outside the line of duty. His classmates hoped that this would drive him out of the Academy. The silent treatment, however, had the opposite effect. It made Davis more determined to graduate. He was the Academy's fourth black graduate. At the start of his junior year at West Point, Davis applied for the Army Air Corps, but was rejected because it did not accept blacks. While Davis and his wife were on his way to his new post in Alabama, they slept in their car because there were not many hotels that allowed colors. From being rejected into the Fort Benning Officers Club due to his race, Davis persevered through it all. After World War II, he graduated from the Air War College in 1950, commanded a fighter wing in the Korean War, and was promoted to Brigadier General in 1954. In 1959, Davis became the first African-American officer to reach the rank of Major General in the Air Force and was promoted to Lieutenant General in 1965. On December 9, 1998, Davis was awarded his four star. He was the first African-American to be so honored upon retirement. 
Women faced many of the same biases during this period in our history. One of the major changes occurring as a result of the war was the role women play in American society. World War II shattered that stereotype with the recognition of two groups specifically, the Rosies and the Wasps. Rosie the Riveter was a cultural icon of the United States, representing the American women who worked during World War II, many of whom produced munitions and war supplies. These women sometimes took entirely new jobs, replacing the male workers who were in the military. One of the aircraft produced during World War II was the F-4U Corsair. The Corsair was designed and produced by the Chance Vought Corporation. When it was found that Chance Vought could not keep up with the military requirements, they subcontracted 4,000 of that aircraft model to the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in Akron, Ohio. Designated as the FG-1, it indicated that it was the first fighter aircraft produced by Goodyear. During production of the FG-1, 50% of the workers on the Goodyear assembly line were women. Three of the women who worked at Goodyear during the war were Helen Farley Arginio, Edith White Franks, and Oma Klein Porter, to whom a video at the Rosie display has been dedicated. Nadine Harris Bloom was one of the founders of the Maps Air Museum. Nadine was also a WASP or Women's Air Force Service pilot. The WASP were civilian female pilots employed by the government to fly military aircraft under the direction of the United States Army Air Forces during World War II. Pilots were needed to move wartime supplies and to move military aircraft from the factory to the war. 25,000 women applied to join the WASPs, but only 1,830 were accepted and took the oath. Of these, only 1,074 of them passed the training and joined, each one freeing a male pilot for combat service and duty. Nadine was one of those selected. Trained at a venture field in Texas, Nadine graduated with WASP Class 43-W-7. During the war, she flew from Newcastle Army Air Base in Delaware, Childress Army Airfield in Texas, Fairfax Army Airfield in Kansas, Honda Army Airfield in Texas, and Long Beach Army Airfield in California. For some, World War II represented a major turning point for women as they eagerly supported the war effort. Others emphasized that the changes were temporary and that immediately after the war was over, women were replaced by returning servicemen and expected to return to traditional roles of wives and mothers. Regardless of the position taken, the Rosies, the Wasps, and the generations that followed them knew that working outside of the house was in fact a possibility for women. The focus of the display that we have titled Homefront World War II is to remind us that the world has changed sometimes because of events outside of the control of the average American. World War II, unlike modern warfare, involved the majority of the male population either in critical industry or in the military. To support a large military presence in two military theaters resulted in much of the food, oil, gasoline, and other products that the American population took for granted being shipped overseas. In order to guarantee minimum amounts of necessities to everyone, especially the poor, and to prevent inflation, the government instituted a rationing program. To get a classification and a book of rationing stamps, one had to appear before a local rationing board. Each person in a household received a ration book, including babies and small children who qualified for canned milk not available to others. Each ration book page had numbered stamps that limited monthly spending. Prices were listed not only by cost, but by points, with 48 points allocated per ration book per month. Ration stamps were valid only for a set period to forestall hoarding. 
purchases in excess of the monthly ration were prohibited. To receive a gasoline ration card, a person had to certify a need for gasoline and ownership of no more than five tires. Families were authorized only one automobile. All tires in excess of five per driver were confiscated by the government because of rubber shortages. When purchasing gasoline, a driver had to display a gas ration sticker in the windshield of the car and present a gas card along with a ration book and cash. By the end of 1942, half of U.S. automobiles were issued an A sticker that allowed four gallons of fuel per week. Keep in mind that on an average, most 1940s cars drove between 15 and 20 miles per gallon of gasoline. On June 6, 1944, Allied forces went ashore on the beaches of Normandy. The night before the D-Day landings occurred, Allied airborne forces from the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions and the British 6th Airborne Division parachuted into the Normandy area to hold key road junction in preparation for the invasion. One of the young paratroops that jumped into Normandy that night with the 101st Airborne Division was Henry S. Fuller from Akron, Ohio. Fuller was photographed as part of a group of young paratroopers listening to General Dwight Eisenhower prior to loading on their aircraft. Three months after D-Day, Fuller would make his second combat jump, this one part of Operation Market Garden in the Netherlands. In January of 1945, Fuller was wounded when a large portion of the 101st was surrounded in the small village of Bastogne in what later became known as the Battle of the Bulge. There are a number of additional displays in the gallery of heroes that honor local men that fought in World War II. Among those displays are the following. Lee Kessler from Canton, Ohio, who served as a gunner on a B-17 Flying Fortress. His aircraft was shot down on a mission over Germany. He was captured and was held in a German prisoner of war camp. Some of Kessler's artwork and a video interview about his experiences are included in his display. Reamer Sewell, who went to Crosby Elementary School in Akron, Ohio, was a navigator on a B-26 bomber stationed in Europe. Like Kessler, his aircraft was shot down and he became a prisoner of war. The original telegraphs that were sent to his family and letters that Sewell sent home from the POW camp are included in his display. W.K. Haynes from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio flew 51 missions over occupied Europe as the pilot of a B-24 Liberator bomber. Like Lee Kessler, a video interview with Haynes about his wartime experiences is included with his display. Adam Parsons who graduated from Akron's Garfield High School, was a C-47 pilot during World War II. On June 6, 1944, he was the co-pilot of a C-47 assigned to drop paratroops from the 101st Airborne Division into Normandy. Clay Baker, also a Garfield High School graduate, flew 35 missions over occupied Europe as the pilot of a B-17 bomber and Charles Kramer, a graduate of Bucktill High School in Akron, Ohio, flew 25 missions from England in B-17s with a 305th bomb group. Heroism comes in all forms, and it is not always found in combat. Jerry Lind graduated from Hudson High School at age 16. He applied for the Air Force Academy but was advised he had to be 17 by July 1st to enter, and he would not be 17 until July 26. So he applied for a scholarship to Purdue University in the Reserve Officer Training Corps program. He received an appointment to the Air Force Academy after completion of his freshman year at Purdue. In 1990, Jerry graduated from the F-111 Flight Training Program and was assigned to the Royal Air Force Base in Upper Hayford, England. On September 17, 1992, he and his weapons officer, Major David McGuire, 
were returning from a training mission when their plane developed mechanical problems which made a crash inevitable. They were instructed by their base controller to eject. If they had ejected, however, the F-111 would have crashed into the village of Upper Hayford with devastating loss of life and property. So they decided to remain aboard and try to land their crippled aircraft. That decision cost both men their lives when their crew capsule ejected from the F-111E aircraft as it crashed near the approach to the runway, just over the fence from the village. While not included in either of the two display rooms currently open to guests at the MAPS Air Museum, there is one other display that deserves to be mentioned in this presentation. The display is located in the main lobby of the museum and honors another who has local roots. Born in Zanesville, Ohio, Sharon Ann Lane was a 1961 graduate of Canton South High School. She attended the Altman School of Nursing in Canton, graduating in 1965. She worked at the Altman Hospital as a general duty nurse for 26 months. She then attended the Canton Business College for two years before deciding to join the U.S. Army Nurse Corps on April 18, 1968. Sharon arrived in Vietnam on April 29, 1969, and was assigned to the 312th Evacuation Hospital at Chu Lai. On June 8, 1969, First Lieutenant Sharon Lane was killed by enemy rocket fire while on duty at the hospital, becoming the first and only female combat casualty of the war. Her name is the first one displayed in Line 112 a panel 23W of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. Some of the displays represent those that have served during the War on Terrorism. The display honoring Richard P. Ramey is one such display. Ramey, a Perry High School graduate, joined the Army in 1996. He was trained as an Explosive Ordnance Disposal, or EOD, specialist. On February 8, 2004, Staff Sergeant Ramey was killed while disarming an improvised explosive device, or IED, in Iraq. In addition to the display honoring Ramey, he also has a carved memorial feather in the museum's fallen feather display. One of 300 each one dedicated to an Ohio resident lost in the war on terrorism. There are well over 100 additional displays in both the Gallery of Heroes and the Ohio Military Museum display rooms that we cannot hope to cover in this short video presentation. Most tell the stories of Ohio residents who served and some who gave up their lives in service to this nation. Maps exist to remember them and to tell their stories. If we and other organizations like us do not preserve their stories and their history, their service and sacrifice will be lost to future generations.